Hello, beautiful listeners. It's your host, Tembi Locke. Welcome to Lifted, a podcast that pulls back the curtain on creativity, resilience, and the extraordinary moments when everything changes. In this episode, I'm continuing my conversation with Andrea and Robin McBride, sisters and founders of the McBride Sister Wine. And if you haven't listened to the first episode, please go back and have a listen to their incredible story of destiny and synchronicity and sisterhood. But in part two of our conversation, Andrea and Robin share the mic with Jess Drury, founder of Winey Baby, a wine brand they launched together in 2022. It was created as a response to a demand for connection, especially among Gen Z consumers. Whiny Baby prioritizes playfulness in everyday life, and as a founder, Jess imagined a wine brand that sparked conversation, cultivated connection, primarily through authentic representation and a relaxed approach to wine. So when you hear how Jess, just a few years out of college, managed to connect with award-winning winemakers, you'll understand why the McBride sisters have said they were inspired by Jess's vision and tenacity. This podcast, this episode, it is all about how we are lifted, how we inspire each other's lives. And the rest of this conversation will certainly do that. So Jess Drury, oh my gosh, lady. Hello. Talk about also someone with like moxie and just like, I I see something, I want to do it. I want to really bring listeners into your story because it's really incredible. And this partnership that you guys are doing is really, I think, a kind of gold standard for female business, for vision. It's just phenomenal. What sparked your interest in wine? Let's just start there. Just basic question. (laughs) Well, first of all, I'm like, my cheeks hurt from smiling because I obviously know the sister story like front and back, but every time I hear it, like you just sit there and you're like, wow. And now I'm sitting here and I'm like, wow, they're my partners. Like it doesn't feel real even for me. So I'm just so incredibly proud, you know, to be sitting alongside them um, and proud of what we're doing. And I appreciate what you're saying too about the partnership. Cause I, you know, even beyond the wine industry, I really feel strongly that, that what we've done is kind of setting a new path forward. So um, before I even get into wine, like the brief background, because, you know, I'm new to wine. I'm I'm new on my wine journey. And that really is kind of the secret uh, to our magic is the fact that in a lot of ways, I still have my uh, new consumer brain on. Um, so before I met the sisters, I had gone to school in San Diego. I uh, studied multimedia. So, you know, have always loved media and storytelling um, and all that good stuff. And uh, I dropped out and uh moved to LA and started working in video production. So I started doing uh, music videos, oddly had a niche in rap music videos, which was fun. Um, I was like, I don't know how I got here, but I love it. Um, And I'd publish my work on Instagram and um, I got reached out to by someone at Red Bull. So again, in hindsight, you see how the things all weave together. Red Bull's, you know, I believe the greatest beverage marketer or marketer period of our generation. Um, and so obviously I've carried a lot of my learnings there, but, um, I was then living and working in Los Angeles and the pandemic hit. I had a first date with a guy and probably not the smartest move, but he invited me over. He said, I'm going to cook for you and you bring a bottle of wine. And so I, that's like a totally normal ask, but I also knew he was like into wine. He was a little bit older. And at that point I was like, 22. Um, and so my experience with wine was like, you know, my friends would maybe grab a bottle of rosé for like a girl's night, you know, growing up, my family wasn't big drinkers, but like I said, wine was a special occasion thing. So I just remember going to the store. I went to multiple grocery stores and I stood there looking at the shelf and had an experience that I think a lot of people, not only my age, but people new to wine experience. And they're like, okay, I don't know what a varietal is. I don't know, you know, what I should be grabbing for what occasion. And it just felt so complicated for, for no reason. And so that night uh, on the date, I was not very focused on my date. I was focused and obsessed with the this experience. Poor guy. I know, <laughs> I know. Is. We're still I friends mean, like, to this day. Yeah, but, well, okay. um, he, yeah. He, was, he, 
he was a way station to a bigger thing. Exactly. Like that's was, all that was. Okay, I'll take the business over love. <laughs> um, but I became obsessed with just the experience of wine. And I think you, when we get more into the details of Winey Baby, you really see that from that moment of, you know, grabbing the bottle on the shelf to opening it up and and the experience and the memories you're walking away with. So uh, that was kind of my aha moment and became my obsession with wine. So the date, the obsession with wine begins, but some people might just be like obsessed with wine and interested in it, but they don't reach out to the McBride sisters <laughs> with an idea. So yes. I'm sorry. Um, let's g- drill down into who inspired you to be the kind of woman who's like, I'm not just obsessed. I'm obsessed. I have a vision. I want to realize that. And I think these women can help me do it. Like, Ooh, who, yeah, who, well, like, did you grow up with entrepreneurs or are your people no, entrepreneurs? I like, grew up with just like, you know, uh, I think a lot of us on this call, a badass mom who raised us practically single. My parents didn't divorce till a little later in life, but she really was the one who was, who was raising us. And, um, yeah, I think that has a lot to do with it, but I also credit, I've had incredible mentors around me, you know, during my time at Red Bull, I, that's one of my favorite things is I think your twenties are like all about kind of collecting people, you know, you meet these people and you don't even realize how they're going to show up in your life, you know, later, later on. But, um, Amy Taylor, she was the CMO at Red Bull. Uh, she's now the CEO at Zevia. Andrea Oddly, again, there's so many, we, we keep saying it, serendipity. Uh, Andrea knows her uh, through her fellowship program. But um, I, you know, at the time at Red Bull, I was low on the totem pole. So my time with her was very limited. I'm, I don't know how much she knew me, but I just, you know, realized, wow, this is someone who is a powerful leader that I can learn a lot from, would take any time I could get with her. And then after I left Red Bull, remained in contact. And to this day, she's been an incredible mentor. So I think I've gotten to work with incredible women, but then of course, having, having that mom in your life that you go, okay, I need to kick in the high gear. (laughs) You said something I want to repeat for listeners, particularly, I'm very interested in quarter life when I'm a parent of a child who just went off to college. So, and I remember my own quarter life time, right? You're a quarter lifer. You're right in that. And there's a great book that everybody should, I'll put it in the show notes. It's called Quarter Life by Satya Bayak. It's really great about that period of discovery in your life. But you just said, Jess, that you collect people in your life. And I think that's a particular mindset that that listeners need to really think about because the people you meet are very formative. And But you're coming into these relationships or um, these encounters with a kind of intention, with not a kind of, with intentionality, right? Oh, absolutely. So you see that there's an opportunity. You know, you're in the marketing industry. You're collecting these amazing women. You've got this badass mom and that all coalesces to an email to the <laughs> so, a call, there's a, a DM. Yes. Like, yes. What happened? So there's a little period of time, which is kind of the, like, I like to call it like the test launch of whiny baby. So, um, I, you know, I'm a firm believer that there's a lot of talk, right? And especially in LA, you know, people in their 20s, you know, everyone wants to be an entrepreneur and, you know, it's incredible. But I think that I quickly realized, okay, I'm seeing a lot of people around me talk and not actually do. (laughs) So I decided to kind of, you know, keep it quiet, keep it to myself, obsess, research the industry. I mean, I was reflecting on it when we were hearing the sister story. They had to find each other in a time when you couldn't, LinkedIn message anyone you wanted or Google the status of the wine industry, you know, so we have more resources than ever. There's really no excuse. Um, But there's a reason why the the wine industry feels really behind and exclusive because it's, it's a tough nut to crack. Um, And so I quickly realized like, okay, like there's, there's information out there, but this industry is hard. So um, from 2020 to 2022, I, self-launched this kind of like proof of concept. And so I figured out how to source the wine again, you know, being from the central Valley, I was able to 
I had no, you know, real contacts, but I would talk to anyone who would talk to me. I'd ask friends and family, can you get me in contact with this person? And long story short, I, you know, figured out how to source the wine, store it, bottle it, create a label, the labels of the original. It's funny because people now call it the reserve <laughs> bottles. Um, the OG bottles, you know, the labels are flawed because I didn't use like a proper wine label person. You know, I used someone who had never done wine labels before. You used a printer in your house? <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Um, but I, I was able to, you know, legally obtain a license that allowed me to ship in California. So, you know, I've got the photos of me and my mom, you know, boxes everywhere, shipping it out ourselves. I launched, you know, just it on Instagram. People to this day told me that they thought it was like a joke when I posted it. Um, and what happened was it, went viral on TikTok, first of all, the power of TikTok, right? Um, and I sold out and I realized, okay, I have something here. I've proved my point and now I need to go after it. Why the name whiny baby? It was the first thing that came to me. People always ask that. I walked out of the store that day. I was like, I need to start a wine brand and I'm going to call it whiny baby. Uh, I can't believe no one had taken the name before, but uh, it really is an homage to Gen Z. I'm a proud Gen Zer, Zillennial. Um, and I think we get a bad rap for, you know, we bring our whole selves to work. Uh, we are not afraid to express ourselves. And it's kind of a little tease at that. But it's also a nod to uh, being, you know, a baby on your wine journey and, and new to it. I'll fast forward to when I met the sisters. I, you know, my favorite thing about them is that I had listened to them on multiple podcasts. So I'd memorized their story, knew who they were, uh, had no connection to them and, you know, just reached out, reached out, reached out, eventually landed a meeting. I had a call with a random gentleman who had worked with them many years ago and said, I maybe have their assistance contact. I can put you an email. Um, but when I hopped on the call, I mean, I think first of all, that's a testament to the fact that they don't just talk the talk, they walk the walk. They didn't need to they don't need to be taking calls with people who, you know, are just aspiring, you know, entrepreneurs and now working with them. I see them, you know, doing that every day. So they're, they're actually living it out. But then when I got that call, uh, you know, it's a little bit like dating. You don't want to be like immediately like, hi, can we enter into a partnership together? <laughs> we talked the whole time. And during that, I, again, I think we just felt that spark and realized that we had that shared mission, right? Of bringing more people into the space of wine, uh, you know, making it the obvious choice for a generation that maybe doesn't see wine as the obvious choice. And then accessibility, which I think we always go back to. Um, I think that the wine styles of Winey Baby are what you would, you know, find and drink at like a little local wine bar in New York or LA, uh, but they're going to be widely accessible to everyone. So that shared mission of creating a lower barrier to entry, uh, I think immediately connected us. I love that. And it reminds me of another part of the work that you guys are doing with the McBride Sisters brand and wine, which is the She Can Fund. So I want to talk a little bit about that. We spend a lot of time, you know, taking calls and having conversations with women in wine and spirits, um, women entrepreneurs, um, informally mentoring and formally mentoring women. Um, and as much as we love to do that, there, there are not enough hours in the day for us to be able to connect with everybody. And so we took that time of the product launch to also create a fund um, where we could provide uh, networking, mentorship, professional development scholarships, and academic scholarships um, formally through the fund. So we launched those both at the same time. Um, and that was in 2019. Andrea and I self-funded the fund for that first year. We had 12 women who went through that um, cohort. Of course, the following year, 2020, everybody's world changed drastically um, for multiple reasons. And at that time, the fund was new. The focus had sort of just been established, but Andrea and I um, kind of took a beat and, and looked to see what was going on in the world and how we could most um, be, be beneficial to women and people of color both business owners and people who were in the wine industry and wine and spirits industry. And so, and we saw some really, as everybody did, just not knowing what was coming next with the pandemic. We saw some very troubling stats that were coming through with the PPP funding and government um, aid to businesses. And we learned that 96% of black owned businesses were 
um, did not qualify or were told that they could not have um, those funds and being women and black women entrepreneurs, we decided that year that we would focus the funds efforts on providing immediate cash grants to black women owned businesses for whatever was needed, whether that was, you know, paying the rent, payroll, equipment, transitioning from brick and mortar businesses to online businesses. Um, and so the fund grew tremendously um, in 2020, and we garnered a lot of support from corporations as well um, who saw what we were doing. And we went from, you know, I think the first year was like a $50,000 um, scholarship fund to um, a total um, with corporate partners of having, you know, $3 million in um, uh um, donations and professional services for the women who were in, in that year. Um, and so we have kind of that kind of started the tra trajectory of us being more conscious and saying every year we're actually going to look and see what's going on in the world um, and in the world of business and and um, with women in business and kind of make a focus, you know, for for each year. And so we went from women professional development, women in wine and spirits, black women owned businesses in 2020. We followed, kind of following the trajectory of what was going on in the world. Also, um, women in um, hospitality and other male-dominated industries. So now we've included hospitality, finance, um, et cetera, and continuing with Black women um, entrepreneurs and a focus of women in, in wine and spirits. And so now we have, I think, over 3,000 women who have engaged with the fund, either through grants, scholarships, mentoring, coaching, and networking. So this year... Um, you know, we are working with Howard University within their business school um, of hospitality and management and now putting that um, programming together um, uh, in terms of like the business, you know, of wine and how we can develop exceptional scholars and help kind of feed and into the greater um, ecosystem for the total sort of macro wine industry. But I do want to I do want to talk about Jess in the sense that, you know, um, initially, you know, when we took the call, I was like, oh, yeah, you know, because everybody wants to be in wine. They, they see the romance of it. You know, everybody has a label idea. And for the most part, I would say 99% of people um, that we talk to would benefit from the, some of the resources that we provide from She Can Fund. Um, but when we met Jess and we were talking to her, I think the thing that blew my mind was that in that period that she talked about before, and she glossed over it, but it is incredibly hard to figure out how to get licensed, make wine, you know, put a, a label on it, get federal approval, just that, just that piece of it, let alone, you know, you set up a social media platform, you know, people follow you, you put a product online and sell it out. And in the period of time that she did that, um, there's the business case of it too. But what I would say is that, you know, a lot, there's a lot of great ideas and concepts, but what makes them really successful is the execution. And we believe the execution comes down to the, per, the person, the people, the team, and, you know, everything ain't for everybody. <laughs> you know, this, <laughs> this, this business is really hard. And so we can see that she had, that you talked about it before, the nose, like the like the 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 discipline, the grind. She didn't have a lot. Made a whole bunch of of you know something from not a lot, and so we could see that she had the DNA. You know it, who she was as a person. She had a brilliant concept from uh, a wine brand standpoint that we could see was filling this gap that we talked about in terms of accessibility for Gen Z for millennials. How she's incorporated play. And, and the focus on creating quality time for her generation, you know, through her wine. Um, um, it was, it, the wine industry had never seen it before, you know? And so there was, uh, and that's why I say, Jess jumped over the She Can't Find. Yeah. Because, oh, because, you know, she, she, she came with all the things, all the proof points that, that we really wanted to be able to be a part of it and help her continue on, you know? Can you guys share either of you um your experience experience navigating this industry wine industry and how it has perhaps shaped your understanding of the unifying power of wine you know really simply our worldview 
is defined by being multicultural, multinational women, you know, so, you know, we feel like we see everybody, you know, and a big part of what fulfills us is getting to gather, eat different cuisines, meet different people, hear about their backgrounds, their experiences, all gathering, that really fulfills us, you know, and so a lot of, a lot of, um, what you see in terms of the way that our business is, is just kind of really who we are, <laughs> you know? And I think what, what has helped advance the business is that um, uh, who we are um, hasn't been represented. And so it's really created like a really big opportunity for us to serve in a really, really meaningful way. Um, and then just because through the kind of through the lens of, um, our experience on the business side of wine, um, which was, you know, for our ambition, you know, we felt like it was really difficult, you know, because of all of um, sort of this inside baseball knowledge, nuance, relationships that you had to have. Um, we felt like, and we always knew that what we were doing was bigger than ourselves, you know, and so, you know, when we see opportunity, it's not necessarily, you know, is this for us? You know, so when we met Jess, we're like, we see it, we get it. Let us help you make sure you don't do all these expensive, crazy things that we did that didn't turn out well, you know, because we think for the, there's enough room for everybody and there's just so much space to continue to help grow the macro wine industry experience for consumers that just hasn't been explored yet. And where do you think that mindset came? Because not a lot of, you know, not every business owner thinks like that, it thinks beyond their own individual net gain, right? What in each of you or in your sisterhood, how you were oriented toward that, that, that more expansive, I mean, I think on the outside, you know, it looks like, well, that's kind of what we as black women do. <laughs> we see the world holistically and we're thinking like, who else can I bring up? But I don't want to, that may not be, maybe there was something in your direct lived experiences that made you sort of say, no, we need to pull people up with us as we go? I think for me, uh, I'll speak for myself, um, you know, my formative years were in, in Aotearoa in New Zealand. Um, my foster family was a Maori family, you know, the native indigenous people, you know, from New Zealand. I would say collectively as a whole, as a country, it is very community, community focused. I would, I would compare and say the United States is very individualistic, you know, so I grew up with this, um, um, this sort of Maori principle of community first, um, and, you know, it starts from um, a lot of the creation stories go back to Papa and, and Rangi, Papa is Mother Earth, Rangi is like the sun, and basically like we are a part of the world and the environment, we have to sustain it, you know, we have to kind of take care of it together. And so I think like that really kind of shaped my mindset around like, you know, um, just having one person succeed um, isn't sustainable, you know, for the long term for us now and the future generations. So I think that kind of really kind of shapes, you know, how I view things and, and the way that I grew up. Also, and for all three of us, I think growing up in agricultural communities, yeah. um, you have that sense of the the greater good because when you what a farmer does next door very much affects what's going on you know with with what you have going on as well and then I, I think also for myself and and Andrea we approach everything because of our up, upbringings and the places that we grew up I feel like we still approach everything with almost an, an outsider's view I think that you know, even though we were parts of communities, just the circumstances in our lives, we always sort of felt like outsiders, right? And so when we um, approached our business in the beginning and looked at the wine industry, it felt like we had a very non-biased, I guess we'll say, ability to take a look at it, you know, from 50,000 feet and be able to see what can help the industry as a whole and how we can plug into that. And I think even so from the time we started our business until, you know, everyday strategies that we're working on now, we still have been able to kind of maintain that sort of non-biased outsider's view on how we're approaching things and how we're finding opportunities and how we're solving for challenges inside and outside of our businesses. That outsider status that you refer to, um, 
I hear that a lot in mm-hmm. successful female businesses. They say they see something from the outside. Some of that might be the fact that women have been locked out of things for so long that we mm-hmm. just kind of are always Big looking part of it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. in a different way. But but Andrea, you said that you don't really have a fear of the downside of something when it comes to business. Mm -mm. Like, okay, first of all, unpack that because I think a lot of people need to hear this. I think that in the process and the journey, you know, when you are working towards something, a lot of times people will view something not happening in a time frame or kind of how the way that you set it out um, as a failure. And I think I speak for both Robin and myself. We just think about if it doesn't happen, you know, in that time frame of the way that we thought about it, that it's a data point as well as I think the the fear, fear of failure um, can be derived from a couple of places. Like one very real in terms of like there's a financial component to it, you know, for failure um, that's going to have like an impact. But I also think too, a lot of the times, the other part of that is, what are other people going to think, you know? And so I think that, you know, for, for both Robin and I, um, we kind of have this mentality of, you know, care about, you know, what other people think and you're going to be their prisoner. It's going to limit what you're going to be able to achieve in your life, you know, and, and they have nothing to do with that. And so I think that's a big part of it. That is gospel. That is gospel. You just took everyone to church (laughs) because that is a really, really valuable thing to do. And it also is an invitation to be very self-directed, to sort of like quiet all the noise. There's always going to be the noise, always going to be the noise. And just say, what is that? I call it purity of purpose for me. Like, Mm -hmm. and I say, you know, when I wrote my, my book, I thought it would cost, I would be suffer more grief, not writing it than writing it and having it not do well. Yeah. Like I could live with doing my best and whatever happened in the marketplace happens, but I had to give myself the grace of trying the thing, right. That meant so much to me. And it feels like you guys are not only embodying that and living that, but you're also handing the mantle off to another generation in Jess and modeling that for her. What does Jess for you making an impact look like? Big question. Um, First of all, the mentorship with them. I mean, it's one thing, like I knew how incredible they were, you know, before entering into the joint venture, but you don't ever really know until you're in it. Um, And every single day, I mean, we talk about it all the time, but they've been to places I haven't. So when I'm turning corners, you know, and I'm scared, I don't know what's around the corner. They're able to, you know, assure me and mentor me because they have gone through that. And when I'm feeling, you know, these like emotions of, you know, just the growing pains of building something, um, they're able to always bring me back higher. Sometimes it's, it's hard, you know, they are, they push me, uh, in the best way. Uh, but it's just, I I'm so incredibly thankful. And honestly, like, I can't stress it enough. I think if more businesses, you know, adopted that model rather than sitting in a room and trying to guess what the generation wants partnering together. Um, and we really are better together. You know, I'm able to kind of sit in that naivety while they guide me. And it's a really beautiful thing. And, um, they're, the specific kind of mentors that if I come and I ask a question, they put it back on me. They want me to dig um, even deeper. But to your question about making an impact, I think I've quickly realized, I actually think this is like a statistic that Gen Z is, has been deemed like the loneliest generation. And I think with the rise of social media and the pandemic and working remotely, and honestly, I still experience, I think that entrepreneurialism is a very lonely journey. Uh, I've learned this past year. So for me, I think making an impact is if someone can say, Hey, through your, your company, through your bottle of wine, I had an experience that made me feel connected, that to me is is making an impact. Women business owners in particular talk about the willingness to be all in, just all, all in. And, and I think what you 
all three of you have done that in each of your businesses, but you're modeling that for other women, you know, and, and, and that it comes back to what we talked about or what you, Andrea talked about is community and those early that what you learned about, what does it mean to lift up and bring in um, work that is going to transform, inspire, and bring everyone along and change, move the needle. I like to begin to sort of wrap up the conversation by asking people about a real heart-centered piece. I think in your story as the McBride sisters, there's loss, losses in that story, right? Um, I have my own story of loss. Many of the listeners have their story of loss. And um, when we think about our final days, what do you want to be known for? And then the second part to that is what is the last glass of wine you would like? I'd like to believe that there's wine in heaven and that that's where I'm going. So that won't be my, my, <laughs> my final glass of wine. <laughs> um, but um, well, I'll start with the last part first. Yeah. My, my last glass would probably be a Sautern. Um, um, but I think like, I would like for myself and, and for us to be remembered, um, one that pr pr proof that, that you can really do anything, um, that our story that, you know, by the time we're done, whatever businesses we've grown and what our impact is, is that it doesn't matter where you start, um, or, or how you start that you can definitely, you know, take charge of your own life and trajectory and follow your passions and find your own success. Um, and I think also that what, what we do and, and what I do is proof of the impact just of human connection um, and the products that we, we make. Obviously, we talked about how we feel that wine is a connector and how it connects people um but also as an example the relationship with with Jess and, and others you know this came to life because there is a true human connection and there's an understanding from some seasoned you know business women to a young entrepreneur and and finding that connection and finding ways that we can uplift each other um and in business and in in person and just in life in general and in personal relationships, I I hope that part of our legacy is that we really fostered human connection and everything that we did. Yeah, and to like sum that up, I would say I hope you know that we were um, that we we were remembered in the terms of guardianship, you know, for people and planet and community. And then, you know, being able to pass it on to the next generation. We're not above it. You know, it's just, you know, it was our time. You know, we laid the, the foundation and then handed it off. And I think, you know, probably like on the McBride sisters, you know, head some stone, there would probably be um, one word, which would be defiant. <laughs> you know? So... I would say for, this is so hard. I feel like I'm, you know, just in those beginning stages, but it's important to look back on. And obviously like with the sisters, even in this short period of time, I take, you know, from them and learn from them and go, whoa, like I want to have the kind of impact that they have. But um, upon one of our first meetings, I get so emotional, whiny baby, I'm going to cry. <laughs> um, they had said something that really stuck with me. And I think in entrepreneurialism, there's like a lot of ego, right? It's fun to go on a podcast and it's fun to do these photo shoots and be part of something really big, something bigger than yourself. But at the end of the day, having a servant's heart, we're here to create a product and to serve our consumers and to hopefully create an impact. And to hear them say that to me, you know, that they have these hearts of like servanthood, you know, that we're here to serve other people, um, that really stuck with me. And so I hope that at the end of the day, you know, I leave that impact. Will you have an uh, OMG wine 
Or will you have, a, what's your, gonna be your final wine? We Everyone knows that my favorite is our Obsessed Red Blend, super icy chilled. Um, it's, it's a special one. And then, yeah, underneath each of our caps is a different conversation starter. So I would pop that bad boy open and be surprised by what question we have. Maybe it's a dare. Sometimes they get a little crazy um, and make some memories. Ladies, this conversation has been epic. It has been amazing. It has been full of heart. It has been full of inspiration, aspiration. And I am so grateful and honored and privileged, privileged to witness and to learn more about what you're doing individually and collectively. I thank you for the oneness. That's the one thing that it just comes to me, the oneness that you are bringing to the industry, but also to the world by what you're modeling. It's just incredible. And I thank you. Lifted is developed, written, and produced by me and my one-woman producing team, Salia Cates. It is edited by Jamie Moss. Thank you for joining us. Stay tuned for our next inspiring episode.